For a more immersive experience, I recommend you wear headphones for this podcast. If you can hear me, it means it's after midnight, both my favorite and also the worst time of day. How does that work? Well, I guess first things first, introductions are in order, just in case you're new here. My name is Carol Green, and I guess the most important thing that you need to know about me is that I'm an overnight employee at a small gas station on a lone deserted highway in the Pacific Northwest. I know, that doesn't really sound very interesting. Just a normal, pretty boring job in a normal, pretty boring life. But if you are here, it means you've probably listened to the other episodes of this story. In which case, you know life at the Gasco ain't boring. Not even a little bit. So listener, let me catch you up on what had happened since the last time we spoke. Things were a bit somber for a while. Of course they were. Mr. Sam insisted I take some time off. Jeb passing was just another piece of broken glass in a growing pile of grief I pushed into the back of my heart. I didn't have any friends close by anymore, or anywhere to go really, so I ended up taking a lot of drives. I did meet my friend Dee for coffee in Seattle one rainy afternoon. But really, there's something about grief and long drives on a highway to nowhere to find your perspective that's easier than hearing the, oh I'm so sorry from people who simply don't know what to say, even if they love you. So mostly, I talked to my own ghosts. We all have them, I think. Not the spooky, scary, haunting kind, but the ghosts of ourselves. The laughing teenager in my passenger seat, on our way to a punk rock show, arm hanging out of the teetop flicking a cigarette, singing to the radio at the top of his lungs. The old man who didn't say much, writing in mostly silence, telling me to be easy rounding the corners or I'd wear out my tires too fast. And be careful with second gear. She's a bit sensitive. The highway was my comfort. One afternoon I came back and I was sitting in the break room, chair cocked back, feet on the table like the shitty teenager I was, reading a shitty romance novel someone had left behind. Oh, Maximilian, we mustn't. And yet, we must. Best way to kill time, if you ask me. Anyway, I was sitting there, and Mr. Sam comes slinking in with a real weird kind of look in his eyebrows, like he's got something to say and he's afraid to say it. Sam holds all his emotions in his eyebrows. You can always read what he's thinking there. They got a mind of their own. I squint at him and I tell him it's okay to start putting me back on the schedule. After all, I gotta work so I can save up and get out of his and his wife's hair. I need my own place so that I can build mosaics of my heart on my walls while I figure out who the hell I am in this wide, wide world and what it all means. Of course, I don't tell him that last part. But he can probably read my eyebrows, too. He shakes his head and laughs and sits down across from me. It's not that, Care Bear, he says, affectionate nickname I'm called by from all the employees around here. This is just a hard thing to talk to you about, and I want to make sure that now's the right time. Right time for what, I wonder? I get a little nervous. Everyone who loves me in some kind of way has left me so far. So I put on a smug face and I ask him if I'm fired. He looks at me like I've lost it and laughs and shakes his head. (laughs) No, listen, Jeb didn't have a lot of family or anything. You know, kind of like you. He lived in that little shack out back. That's something that in the old days caretakers at properties could do. Like the maintenance man at a motel or a school or an all-night mechanic. I nodded, I know. I had gone around there many times for tea and cake we all had. I watched them cleaning it out over the past week. 
Couldn't bear to look at it without him in it. Sam sighed. Here's the deal. He didn't know you for long, kiddo, but he cared a whole lot about you, just like we all do. And I like to think... Dramatic pause, Sam, get to the point. I like to think he'd have wanted you to take it over. Just till you get to a point where you're more on your feet. Sam was always really careful to tiptoe around my life situation. Take it over? You mean live in Jeb's place? I blinked and sat back, mind reeling. Sam put his hands up. Look, Care, this isn't about us rushing you out the door at all. You can say no. Lord knows I'm not sure if I could do it. But it's there, and it's safe, and it's a roof, and it'd be your own space. Your own room, if you want it. Right now it's sitting empty, which to me is a whole lot more depressing than whatever heartbeat you'd bring into the place. I'd rather it be a life source than an empty shell. He spreads his hands and I can see it in his eyes. The emptiness haunts him too. Empty means something's done. Over. A finale. Maybe filling it again restarts the show, you know? An encore. I was nervous about it, but we decided to test it out anyway. Just for one night. I could borrow an air mattress from Edgar, and I could sleep there and see how I felt. It wasn't a big space. It was like a studio apartment, tiny really. Had a kitchenette on one end and a closet and a bathroom on the other. Perfect for one person. Hardwood floor and concrete built so you didn't hear much of the daytime going on. It's like, like it was made for a night shift employee, to be honest. I didn't know how it would go the first time. In Sam's place, I'd had the reoccurring nightmares. Even though I mostly slept during the day, due to the nature of my job, it was hard to sleep anyway because people on a normal schedule made their regular daytime noises, and that jolted me awake every few hours. Still, despite that, the nightmares persisted. The kind where you can wake up as many times as you want, but when you fall back asleep, they creep back in. Gnashing of teeth. Fear. Loneliness. Darkness pressing in. Drowning in a pool of deep purple. I didn't know if I could escape them. I didn't know if being in a place that was haunted with memories of someone I cared about would help. I got ready for bed. In my empty room. Mattress on the floor. Glass of water and a romance novel. I laid down and stared at the ceiling fan. I could still smell the cherry tobacco that lingered from Jeb's pipes. There's a kind of liminal space in sleeping in an empty room with no furniture, close to the floor. Inside a box, the sound of your own heartbeat. Forgetting that you can get up and pee whenever you want and not have to worry about disturbing anyone or running into someone in the hallway. Alone with yourself. The threshold to a new life. I woke up. No nightmares. I decided to sleep there the next night too, just to be sure. The third night, I thought, maybe I'll buy a plant? I could always keep it in Bella's room if I can't do this. The day after that, Sam and Co. delivered a real mattress and a bed frame, just so my back wouldn't start hurting. Bev gave me a giant signed poster of Goldie Belmonte to hang after the guys painted the walls lilac and yellow with pink and teal splashes, so it looked like I was living inside a Dixie cup from the 80s. It was hideous, and I loved it. I thrifted a desk. I slept better every night. I had a space to put clothes I bought, something I bought, I chose, in my closet that no one else had control of. Shelves, a stereo, one of those small TVs with a VHS player built in for the stack of corny horror I'd collected. Plushies? I played the stereo loud. Never, ever would I have been allowed to do that. And I danced. Because I wanted to, not for the beauty or the talent contests or cheerleading or gymnastics. I danced for the boy with the cigarette, for the old man, for myself. I went back to work not long after. I didn't have a nightmare in a whole week. The first night back on shift, I did get a bit of a jump scare when Jeb came strolling in to get his hot water through the locked door. But you know what? I looked at him, really looked at him. And I saw that old memory was smiling. Eyes glittered and flicked in my direction. Though I knew he was seeing nothing, he wasn't there. This was just the imprint of a memory. The imprint of a memory that ingrained smiling at the 19-year-old kid behind the counter so much that it was recorded in the final VHS tape of his life. 
I was there in that smile. And listener, the relief it filled me with, the comfort it gave me. Sam was right. He would have wanted his place to remain the heartbeat of the gas station. And I would make sure that it did. Anyway, I guess you're probably not here to listen to my life ramblings. The diary of my journey. Or maybe you are. I do have a lot of followers on Tumblr. Either way, it was now that I started to feel the healing creeping in. The glass pieces gluing themselves back together with resin and glitter and hope. Enough of that, though. Don't you worry, listener. It's story time. We have arrived. So yeah, I started working the night shifts again. It started out normal enough. I'd see one, maybe two, mostly no people the whole night, just like it had always been. Like I said earlier, I didn't really have a lot of friends at this point to chit-chat with, so I had to find other things to occupy the hours and hours of my time that was right now drinking five slushies in a row till I got extreme brain freeze. So I'd browse the internet, or read the cheap horror comics they sold at the counter for some reason I never figured out. Sam, I think you know things you refuse to say out loud. I really think you do. I ask myself, now what is it about working those hours that would make me have the urge to look up all the spooky things I could think of? Cool art of cryptids, dream core, and other people's artistic impressions on liminal spaces? I spent hours reading up creepypasta and made up stories on the No Sleep archives, wiki articles on the craziest things truckers have seen while driving at night. Honestly, though, none of the stuff I read really scared me. I'm not being cocky. I'm a huge chicken, really, but I'd seen the real thing. And these people had no idea what it was really like with their two-sentence horrors. Now that's not to say there's not some great stories out there. Just that maybe I was searching a bit to find stories that sounded more like mine. Stories about the blackness of night, being alive in a way that words can't describe or disembodied headlights that move and shift with an eerie green glow, like they're straining to shine through dark water. So yeah, either way, it was probably weird of me. Am I paranoid? Not particularly. I barely flinched at the static people that walked the aisles anymore. I wore my jacket when I got cold, and on particularly active nights, my breath would blow out steam despite the warm, damp summer air outside. But nothing ever really interacted with me. However, despite that, a few days in, I started feeling watched. There's no other way to describe it. No matter where I went, there was an unrelenting feeling of dread in the air around me. I'd feel eyes. The hair on the back of my neck would stand straight up. But there was never anything there. The windows in the front of the building remained empty. The woods to the left and right of me, undisturbed. Sometimes the motion lights on the side of the building would turn on for no reason. I didn't really feel like that was out of the ordinary. Could be a deer or a particularly large bug. I was no biologist, but some of the shit I saw in the old black and white camera screen seemed unnatural. Wouldn't surprise me if a Katie did the size of my face with twice the amount of eyes it should have could trigger a motion light. Again, I came from a nearby town. I didn't spend a lot of my youth in the woods. Who was I to say that wasn't totally normal? Spoiler alert, dear listener. It's not. The next morning when I push the door open after unlocking it, I usually unlock it around five, when the sun starts peeking up between the trees, I realize the entire front of the store and trailing off through the lot was covered in a weird sort of sticky substance. Not like spider webs. It was denser than that. And, and yet finer? I have no idea how to describe it, honestly. A film with a stringy texture. It was even covering the lights that overhung the pumps. Not gonna lie, it was pretty gross. It took the guys most of the morning to power wash it off. The fourth night after restarting the shifts. I'm working, minding my business, reading comics, and I have that feeling of being watched yet again. And it's weird, but it seems like the room is slightly darker than I remember. Muted. I look up to see if one of the fluorescents had gone out. No, everything seems fine. And I realize with a start that I can sense something moving out of the corner of my eye outside of the front windows. Now listener, brace yourself. If you aren't a fan of the creepy crawlies, 
I suggest you turn around and come back another time. Believe me, I wish I could. Giant moths. Hundreds of them. Blocking out the entire area of glass. Just crawling around, wings twitching. Look, I'm a simple human. I don't mind a bug or two. Hell, moths are even kind of pretty sometimes. And maybe if it was like one, maybe I could deal with that. Maybe I could observe the scale of their wings and colors I can't describe to you with awe instead of horror. Honestly though, not when there's like 500 of them. Just no. Bugs are neat, okay? This is like your entomologist cousin's dream, but not for me. So what do I do? Well, what I normally do. Hide for half an hour under the cash desk trying to breathe. Try and logic the situation out. I wonder if it's the lights attracting them. I know the lights and the sign in the parking lot are working even if I can't see them through the swarming mass of bodies. So I guess it's weird that they'd go for the store lights. But hey, at this point, I'm out of answers. These things make no logical sense that I can find. I even spent 15 minutes browsing insect archives under the desk on my phone. Nothing. So I do the most logical thing that I can think of, turn out all the store lights. I decided to leave the ones outside on, hopefully to draw the moths away from the windows, but nothing happened. The creatures remained clicking and twitching, crawling in lazy circles, wings overlapping, and dust motes the size of my little finger floating around. And now it's weirder because I'm just sitting in the dark, watching this weird moving wall of legs and wings crawling all over my storefront with me trapped inside. Okay, okay, think. Clearly turning out the store lights and trying to draw them away didn't work, but what do they want? I get up and creep closer, trying not to alert them too much so they don't get worked into a frenzy and be even grosser than they already are. They're kind of glowing, backlit in a strange kind of way. The lights from the outside are reflecting through them like some kind of horrid neon screensaver. Some of them start to flutter. I flop backward on my butt watching the horror film in front of me. You know how you see a spider or something and you don't want to kill it, but you're also super icked out by it and want it to leave your house? So you creep up on it, but you have this terrifying, sinking feeling that it's going to jump in your face and get stuck in your hair? That's how I was feeling. And these guys were huge. The dust on their wings glittered and glistened in the neon outside lights in a weird and uncanny way. Maybe it was kind of beautiful. I wouldn't know. I was distracted. Too many. Too big. And now, I'm starting to get annoyed. The delivery truck is going to pull up in the back in not too long, and I ain't going outside with a place that looks like a mason jar on a scientist's window seal. A job is a job. I get up and slam my hands against the glass and yell. <laughs> they do not go. The glass rattles under my hands, and they get worked up into a frenzy, flapping, twitching, clicking their legs, wing dust exploding around them in a supernatural fog. I do it again, and they scatter from my hands, and I scream and jump back, because there's a face peering at me from the other side of the glass. I jump backwards, trip, and fall on my butt again. The face is deathly gray, the eyes pupilless and looming, a bit too big for the proportions. She reminds me of the moths. The scales on her face are like the ones on the creature's wings. She is both somehow mesmerizingly beautiful and absolutely horrifying. She points a withery finger past my shoulder and I turn around to see what the hell she's pointing at, stomach swooping for fear of what I'll see standing behind me. There's nothing, just racks of random gas station snacks and goods for the late night traveler. I look back and shake my head, frustrated coupled with freaked out. I can't tell what she's pointing at. If the supernatural can make a face of annoyance and being done with your shit, then that's how I would describe the look she gave me. She narrowed her many eyes, seemingly thought for a moment, and breathed steam onto the glass, using the tip of her finger to write a shaky word. I narrow my own eyes and stare at her for a beat. The condensation fades. She stares back with depthless eyes, body twitching slightly, not unlike the creeping, twitching hard that still frames her face. I stand up slowly, so as not to startle the moths. I walk backwards, towards the shelf on the far side, near the car stuff. There's a small, emergency household item shelf. I pick up two blister packages, never breaking eye contact with her. I could swear the moth's eyes are following me, too. She points to the package in my left hand. I swallow and bring it back. I tell her through the glass, it's $2.74, and she can leave the money on the sidewalk, 
but she's got to take her moth squad to the far end of the parking lot. And then I'll put it out on the sidewalk out front, because there ain't no way in hell I'm opening this door for Mothman's grandmother. She shrugs and pulls out a tiny coin purse, like you old ladies usually have. It looks silken, with woven glass beads in an intricate pattern. She counts the change out and places it on the sidewalk in a neat little pile, kind of like an offering, and motions to her beasties to follow her. She walks to the far side to watch, a woman with hundreds of fluttering creatures that look like a living fog above her head, glittering and catching the light in strange ways. I open the door carefully, looking around to make sure that no one's about to jump me, and I place the light bulb down and retreat inside, relocking the door. I watch her reapproach, pick up the item, inspect it carefully, smiling wide, revealing a mouth devoid of teeth, instead with what looks like feelers squirming between her lips in the gaping black hole. She gives me a cheerful wave, and I watch as she and her horde disappear into the trees. I am not sure what the hell just happened. The next morning, I'm still sitting on the floor, lights out, when Sam shows up. He doesn't seem surprised, honestly, that the front of the store is covered with the thin, strange film, the motes of unearthly dust floating in the morning light. He looks honestly just kind of tired and resigned. I still haven't had the nerve to ask him if he knows. This is the first real time that something has actually happened during my shift that wasn't ghosts wandering in and out pointlessly, or the Volvo's beams passing through. He looks at me with his eyebrow language that tells me he knows something and that he knows that I know something, but neither of us broach it. He asks if I'm going to quit suddenly, which I really don't understand, because why would I quit? I'd seen the ghosts. I knew this place was different. I look at him like he's lost it and shake my head with a funny little smile. No. This was the first time that a thought crossed my mind, an inkling of an idea. He helped me up, and I said to him, Just so you know, I am absolutely making a podcast about this place. If you haven't got an issue with that, if I can figure out how. And wouldn't you believe it? He agreed. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Maliminal. Be sure to follow social media or subscribe for updates. Want to know more now? This podcast is actually based on a webcomic, and you can read it right now for free on Tapas or Webtoon. Just search for Maliminal, a horror romance about me, Caro, my podcast, and my desperate attempt to win a grouchy barista's heart. Or for Seemingly Dark, a long-running supernatural comic full of ghosts, mysteries, and of course, I'm there too. Follow the creator, Raptor Jewels, on Instagram or Twitter, or follow Seemingly Dark on Tumblr. Logo and music design is by Snake Pixel on Twitter. A special shout out and thanks to my current Patreons, and hopefully, I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening.